Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I could tell as soon as Danny showed her in that this dame was trouble. No, not that she was trouble, but that she was bringing me a world of trouble that wasn't of her doing. Just a feeling I had as I looked up and saw her in the door. Hello, Mr. Carter? She asked nervously. I could tell she was married, as most of my clients were. Nick Carter, ma'am. I nodded. No, not like the punk kid singer, but I sometimes get mail for him. One of the hazards of being a PI with a famous name that lives in LA. My dad actually named me after a secret agent in a set of dime store spy novels by Jove Publishing. We had the last name already, but my dad just named me Nick. Not Nicholas. Nick. Go and figure out. I rose as I spoke and shook her hand. What can I do for you, ma'am? Your assistant said that you could help me. I was referred by one of your previous clients. She smiled a bit more, still nervous, though. I see. Okay. Mrs. I'm Janine Linder. My husband is Dennis Linder, and he's a psychologist. I have reason to believe he's cheating on me, and I want proof before I file for divorce. She said, handing me a picture of him. I raised my eyebrow as I regarded the picture. He looked to be about 40, with a square jaw and dark hair going gray at the temples. He had bright green eyes that would probably tempt most women. Okay, ma'am, you know how this works. I asked, and she nodded. Good. Give me two weeks tops, and I'll have the evidence you need. For those two weeks, I charge $5,000. Is that acceptable to you? Yes, and half up front, correct? She asked. Do you have your own account that your husband doesn't know of, or have access to, in order to check your finances? I asked. Yes. She said. I set it up a couple months ago, so he wouldn't know if I hired someone to track him. Your former client says that you are the best. She smiled then handed me a cashier's check for $2,500. Thank you, ma'am. Give me an idea of how he's been acting suspicious, if you would. The more information I get now, the easier it will be to track his movements. Well, it's a bit strange that I even caught on that he was cheating. He spends every night with me, and the weekends too. But sometimes when I call his office for a lunch date, his phone is turned off. She said, well, he could have a client run over during a session. I shrugged. Normally, you would be right. But then there's the distance at home. He used to be all over me, but now he hardly touches me. Then I noticed the perfume smell on his clothes. At first, I thought I was imagining it, but it wasn't my brand of perfume. She said, some of his clients could have hugged him, and how old is he? I asked. He's 44. She said, and I nodded. Well, I heard that men that age have lower sex drives than they did before hitting 40. Could that be the reason for his distance emotionally? You sound like you think it's just me being stupid. She said angrily. No, ma'am. I am just trying to figure out why you would think he's cheating. I admit, the perfume is a pretty heavy indicator, but it could just be circumstantial. I'm going to take this case, but I also need to know everything you can think of. How is he acting suspicious besides turning his phone off? Well, it's always just before lunch on Mondays and Wednesdays. Other times, he answers right away. But on those days, it goes straight to his voicemail. Okay. I think I get the picture. Tomorrow is Wednesday, so I'll start my investigation then. I will be in touch as soon as I have anything concrete for you. I nodded and rose from my chair as she did and shook her hand. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I hope it's nothing, to be honest. But I need peace of mind on this. She smiled warmly. She really was a knockout, and if I hadn't been married, I would maybe consider consoling her. Anytime, Mrs. Linder. If I don't find anything at the end of two weeks, you will not have to pay me the remainder of my fee. I told her. It's my guarantee. Thank you again, Mr. Carter. She said. Ma'am, call me Nick. Mr. Carter was my dad. I smiled, and she smiled back. Okay, Nick. I'm Janine. Ma'am is too formal. Okay, Janine. I'll be in touch as soon as I have anything for you. Danny, my assistant, should have your information, so I'll get your number from her. I showed her out and promised again to be in touch. As soon as Janine had left, Danny came in and plopped down on the overstuffed chair in front of my desk. Daniela Velasquez has been my assistant for six years. I would honestly be lost without her, and I think she knows it. She's single, dates some, but not often, and has the most gorgeous jet black hair, doe brown eyes, and a great tan that comes from her Mexican heritage. She's built like J-Lo, but with more junk in the trunk and way more of a rack. Yeah. If I wasn't married to the woman of my dreams, Danny would be in trouble. I might be married, but I'm not dead, and I never touch. Well, except for hugs. Okay, Chief. 
This is what I got for you right now. She handed me the file she'd put together online about our target. Danny is a pretty good PI in her own right, and I was proud to be the one who taught her. She's a quick study, that's for sure. Dennis Linder, psychologist extraordinaire. I looked at the file, and a warning bell went off in my head. It seemed that a former patient had filed a malpractice claim against him a couple years back, but the claim had been dropped mysteriously, with some stock cliché answer given as to why. This was getting more and more interesting. The former patient was female, and her husband had divorced her soon after the malpractice claim had been dropped. That was the warning bell. I had a bad feeling about Dr. David Linder, and my gut is usually right. Danny, dig a bit deeper on this prick, will ya? I got a bad feeling about him. I said, and Danny giggled at my phraseology. Ha ha. Yeah, I know. I opened the door for that one, and thanks for not stepping through it. Anytime, boss man. She winked at me prettily, then stepped back out to her desk to do some more Bing searches on Dr. David. Daniela is worth twice her weight in gold, and I know that I don't pay her enough, even though I pay her very well. We're more partners than boss and assistant. We split each case take 60 40ths, including retainer fees. Those retainer fees, when added up between multiple clients, equal over 200k a year. After expenses, I usually clear 150k, and Danny clears 110k easily and that's after taxes. We share a lawyer who gives us legal help quid pro quo since we kind of work for him too. Wesley Quinton is his name, and divorce disputes and other domestic issues are his game. Then there's my wife Samantha. Yes, Samantha Carter, formerly Samantha Stern. So no relation to Colonel Carter on Stargate SG-1. She goes by Sammy for short. I met Sammy seven years ago when I had quit the company I was working for in Langley, Virginia, and moved back to L.A. I was an insurance investigator for that company. It was a decent living, but after a client in Paris turned out to be a real prick, I decided I'd had enough and put my investigative skills to good use back home. I had enough saved up to start my own PI business. There, now nothing can be redacted. Sammy is a complete knockout. Tall at 5 feet 8 inches, which puts her even with me in height when she wears her 4-inch heels. Fiery red hair. Sparkling blue eyes. 34C-24-36 measurements and legs that go all the way up to heaven. Her Angelina Jolie lips and sexy smile can melt the hearts and raise the erections of any man within 50 feet, and she has it all packed in the right places. I first met Sammy back when I had solved my first case for my first client. He threw a bash to celebrate me finding and returning his property. I was his guest of honor, and Sammy was the daughter of one of his friends. She saw me, and I saw her and it was as if the magnetic force of the earth drew us together. We talked and danced, and talked some more. I met her father, who is a good man, and he bought my usual line about being a former insurance investigator that decided to go into the private sector as a PI I had prospects, and during the shindig, I managed to score some more clients. That was seven years ago, and after dating for six months and living together for six months, we were married in a small ceremony with just her family and a few of our friends. My parents had died a few years back in a car wreck when I was out of the country and had left me their paid-off house in their will. Me? I spent three years in the army as an MI interrogator, then got recruited by the aforementioned company to investigate possible insurance fraud. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Anyway, I became a damn good investigator and realized I could make some damn good money at it as a PI, so I bid the company adieu and headed back home to LA getting a concealed carry license was like pulling teeth but it was worth it to carry my dad's old Colt M1911A1 pistol. The big .45 ACP ammo pretty much guaranteed a kill if fired with accuracy. That was one thing I've always been good at. Shooting. So I went out to where Danny was picking out bits and pieces of Dennis Linder's life and printing them out for me. Hey, Danny. Go ahead and knock off for the day when you're done with the searches. I'm heading home. I smiled at her. No problem, Chief. She smiled back at me with more than professional respect. You know, I hope Sammy knows what she got at home. I think she does, sweetie. You know, you're gonna make some guy really happy someday, if you ever settle down. I winked at her, flirting a bit. Not nah, Poppy. I missed my chance by a few months. She shrugged. I opened my mouth to ask her about that, but she had already turned back to her computer monitor. Okay, sweetie. Go ahead and get the info, folder it, and I'll be in first thing to pick it up. Good night, I said as I headed towards the door. Good night, boss man. She called out as I left the office.
I got in my car and headed home. Somewhere along the way, I started thinking about Sammy and how she'd been acting lately. Over the past couple months, she'd been kind of distant, as if she had something on her mind and wanted to tell me. But it always seemed as if something was holding her back. I resolved that when I got home, I was going to ask her about it until she told me. I would be an idiot to not see the writing on the wall. I'd seen it enough over the years. The story was always the same. Wife slash hubby was always emotionally distant either just before or just after starting an affair. Thus far, she kept telling me nothing whenever I asked her what was wrong or if she wanted to talk to me about something. Why women do the whole nothing routine? I'll never know. I know a few who don't, but most of them seem to think us guys get paid enough to read minds. Sorry, ladies. We're not psychic. Sometimes you have to spell it out for us. It was with those thoughts in mind that I pulled onto our street and noticed the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo parked out in front of my house. As I was pulling into our driveway, my cell rang. Hey, baby. I said when I saw my wife's name on the caller ID. Hey, Nick. When are you going to be home? We have something to discuss with you. She said. Her voice sounded weird. What do you mean, baby? Who's the we you're talking about? I had my suspicions that the we included whoever drove that Jeep. Just come home as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. Baby. I love you. I said. Okay. Bye. Now the alarm bells in my head had turned into a full-blown klaxon horn. I made sure my pocket recorder was in my pocket and ready to go, and my cell phone had picture capability. I readied my camera function, just in case. I had no idea what had gotten into Sammy. She never failed to tell me she loved me, even lately. Now this? I was breathing deeply, doing some breathing exercises to calm myself. Once I had the Zen vibe going, I got out and took a snapshot of the license plate on the Jeep. I had a real bad feeling about this one. My gut was screaming at me, and I have always listened to my gut. As soon as I got in the door, I saw them kissing. They had no idea that I was that close, and I managed to get a snapshot of them together with their lips locked. I walked in, calm as can be, snapping happily away until they noticed me. I hit the record button on my pocket recorder in, where else, my pocket. Oh my god, Sammy said. You scared me, Nick. Care to explain why you're kissing some prick in my house, soon to be ex-wifey? I asked, eyebrow raised as I shut my phone. It's part of the reason why I wanted you to come home, Nick. She said. I looked at the prick for the first time, and I suddenly had the urge to pull my weapon and put a hole through his head big enough to drive a Mack truck through. Dennis Linder, my current target, was standing in my living room and towering over me. Okay, this was a sticky situation. My client's husband was now standing in my house and apparently has been screwing my wife. Right then, I wanted nothing more than to shoot him dead, and her too for that matter. My heart was breaking, but my anger kept the herd at bay for the moment. However, if I was going to get paid, I had to play this cool. Vengeance would come later. Payback is a witch and a half, and these two were going to feel every bit of it. Okay, what is it you want to talk about? I asked, with much more calm than I actually felt. Mr. Carter, may I call you Nick? A-hole asked. No, only friends call me Nick. You're not a friend. You're the a-hole who's screwing my wife. Therefore, but definition, we will never be friends. Got it? I asked with a sneer. Yes. Well, I'm Dr. Dennis Linder, and I am treating your wife with sex therapy. He said, identifying himself. Okay. Does sex therapy include kissing my wife in my home? I asked, eyebrow raised once again. As a matter of fact, right now it does. I know this is highly irregular and probably difficult to swallow, but you will need to watch us while we're doing it. He said, Dear God, this guy was dumber than a box of bowling balls. He was playing right into my hands and solidifying not only my own divorce proceeding, but making sure his wife gets everything except for my alienation of affection and malpractice lawsuits that I was already planning. I just looked at him for a moment. Dr. Dennis Linder, huh? I heard you're really good at what you do. Psychology, right? I asked, buttering him up. Yes, psychology. My methods are sometimes controversial, but I always get results. He preened. So how long has my wife been going to you for? Therapy? I asked, biting back my own outburst that was straining and chomping at the bit to get out. Two months now. He confirmed. Sammy had said nothing about going to see a shrink. I looked at her. Then, Sammy, if things were so bad, why didn't you just talk to me? I told you years ago when we were dating that if anything was wrong, you could come to me. Don't you remember that? I asked, trying to get through to her. I. I guess. 
she said in a hesitant tone of voice. She had a confused expression on her face for a moment. Sammy, remember what we talked about, Dr. Dipshit said. Control, you have to assert your control. I know you don't like being powerless, so you have to take the lead. Remember, his voice was strange, almost hypnotic as he talked to her, and I saw her expression harden. You're right, Dennis. I need to show him that I'm not just some dumb woman to be pushed around. She then glared at me. Sammy, what are you talking about? I almost shouted. When have I ever pushed you into anything? I. In the bedroom. We always make love how you want, never how I want. She almost screamed at me. Okay, Sammy. You know what we said after we were married. That if we wanted to try something new, just discuss it and see what happens. Remember that? I asked. All you had to do was ask, and we could at least talk about it. Once again, her expression turned to one of confusion. But before Dr. Dick Nugget could say anything, her expression hardened again. Nick, I need to do this. I need to see what other tools are out there for me. You can either watch or don't watch. But I am going to do this. She said firmly. Sammy, don't do this. Please. I really wanted to say, give me more evidence. Please. But I refrained. I would be getting way more evidence. I need to, Nick. This won't affect us. I still love you. She said with a hint of a smile. I knew she was lying to me then. I just need something different, and just this once. Oh? Well, for the record, I do not want you to do this, and there will be consequences if you go through with it. I said, shaking my head in what I hoped to appear resignation that I would reluctantly accept it. Mr. Carter, please allow me to do my job. Now, do you have a chair in your bedroom? He asked. He wanted to screw my wife on our marital bed. Note to self, burn the bed and get a new one. We do, yes. Wait. Do you really want me in there? I asked with a horrified look on my face. It is necessary, yes. Dr. Dumb said. If you insist. I snarled. Doctor, is there no other way to get my wife back to normal? None. I'm afraid. He said with mock sincerity that wouldn't have fooled a kindergartner. Well, I hope you don't expect me to participate in adultery. I said pointedly. Mr. Carter, what your wife and I will be doing is hardly adultery. I am merely helping her to get past a mental block and assert herself better in your relationship. You will both be stronger after we're done. He gave me a smarmy smile when he said that, and once again it took an Olympian effort of will for me not to shove my pistol down his throat and empty the magazine into him. I am not agreeing to this, just so you know. I will never agree to an act of adultery performed by you and my wife, and this is adultery, no matter how you slice it. I said, noticing that he wasn't wearing a wedding ring, and with no sign of tan line on his finger. As I said, Mr. Carter, this is therapy. Granted, it's controversial therapy, but it is not adultery. His smile this time was condescending. Oh, this was going to very fun after a bit of pain. Well, not pain. My love for Sammy had died, and I was feeling numbness and a keen sense of righteous fury at what I was going to do to this a-hole after he finished screwing my soon-to-be ex-wife. Since my wife had agreed to all this, for me she is damaged goods and there is no point of fighting for her. Only thing that I would do now is to gather all the evidence and ensure that they have a meeting with Karma soon. She is not worth jail time anymore. I'm still not agreeing to it. I shook my head, even as I followed them to the master bedroom. I surreptitiously took out my iPhone and started the camera rolling as he undressed Sammy and had her lie on the bed. Soon he undressed too and neither one of them looked my way as I sat in the chair to get plenty of footage. Last chance, you too. I said, don't do this. This is being done without my consent. I said to ensure that it is recorded and that I have not consented to this act. The doctor looked at me, with my iPhone sticking up out of my jacket pocket, but he didn't realize it was recording video. He sneered, like you have a choice in it, punk. He then thrust forward into Sammy, and that was it. That was all I needed to see. It was all I needed to record. Janine's case was now airtight. And that was that. I stood up from the chair and walked calmly to where Dr. Needle Dick was laying into Samantha with relish and abandon. I grabbed him by the hair and yanked hard, pulling him backwards and out of her. I then hit the nerve bundle between his neck and shoulder, and he folded like a bad poker hand. He was still conscious, but unable to move. You thought I would not do anything. Doctor, my ex-wife never told you what I do for a living, did she? I could see the confusion in his face. Sammy was glaring at me now, as if I had grown a third eye. I'm a private detective, doctor. I now have evidence of you attempting to cuck me with my wife. Now I have the proof I need for an infidelity divorce. I have video and audio. 
I also now have proof of alienation of affection and malpractice. I grinned in triumph, then reached to my belt and drew my sidearm. See, you're a big man, doctor. I might lose to you in a straight-up fight. But Colonel Sam Colt makes all men equal in the eyes of God. You should be able to move in a moment. Once you can, get dressed, grab your 304, and get out of here. I said it calmly and evenly, which scared the living bejesus out of both of them. I heard Sammy gasp. Good. I looked over at the woman who had just broken my heart. Samantha, you need to get dressed, pack your shit, and get the hell out. What? She demanded. You heard me. I told you there would be consequences if you went through with this, and those consequences are going to be pretty bad. I felt detached. I felt as if my emotions weren't functioning as they should. Those consequences start now. You will pack your things, put them in either your car or his SUV, and leave. I am going to call my attorney and have him draw up divorce papers. Then get a restraining order against you and the good doctor here. I'm just glad we don't have children, and damn glad that I will never be a father to your children. I shook my head. Sammy, you broke my heart. I hope it was all worth it for you. My voice cracked during that last sentence. If lover boy here doesn't want anything to do with you, go stay with your folks. Sammy's face went through a variety of emotions as she processed what I just told her. Her main emotion appeared to be confusion. But Nick, don't you love me anymore? She said in wide-eyed innocent shock. Not after you willingly let another man, over my protests, take you in our marital bed. I shouted that last bit. You have desecrated the vows we took on our wedding day, Samantha. Over my protests, you shit all over everything we ever had. Yeah, I really let her have it this time. I wanted her to hurt. I wanted her to feel a measure of the pain in my heart when I figured out that she didn't love me anymore. I can't believe that I never even knew you, Samantha. I was calling her by her full name, since I knew she hated it, and because she knew that I only called her that when I was angry. Samantha, do you remember the talk we had shortly before we got married? The one about fidelity? Remember that one? The one where you said that you would not tolerate cheating. The one where you said you had zero tolerance for cheaters. Well, honey, this qualifies. I saw the wisdom in your words that day and adopted your philosophy. A hole stirred before she could reply and appeared to be giving serious thought to jumping me. I stepped away from him, keeping Sam Colt trained on him. I also made sure I kept Samantha in my field of vision. You're making a mistake, Mr. Carter. I'm going to press charges. He sneered. No mistake. I caught you in bed with my wife and thought she was being assaulted. Who are the cops going to believe? The respected private investigator who caught a criminal or the man who claims it was all consensual. Look at Samantha, doctor. Look at the anguish on her face. The anguish of being assaulted. It's a good thing I got here when I did, isn't it? Otherwise, you might have gotten away with it. Now, maybe I should call the police and report this. His face paled as he hesitated, then thought better about it. Fine. No harm. No foul. He tried to chuckle, but it fell flat. No charges. I noticed that he still hadn't mentioned his wife. That was interesting. He probably thought he was keeping a secret from me, and I would allow him that illusion, for now. I had to prod him a little, though. I'm sure the news stations are going to love this one, though. P.I.'s wife caught in bed with her psychologist. Story at 11. I shook my head with a disgusted look on my face. That was when he blanched. No. You can't go public with this. He nearly shouted. He was dressing quickly, making sure he had everything he came in with. Please. Don't go public with this. He was begging now. I had him. If you return all the fees my soon-to-be ex-wife paid you, I might consider it. I'm still pressing A of A and malpractice against you, though. I said, backing him into a corner. Done. Anything you want. He said with a panicked look in his eyes. Anything I want? Oh, the possibilities. But no. I wanted him to know fear. I wanted him to feel the fear before the inevitable despair. The total devastation that his life was about to become. I was enjoying myself over this, and I felt no guilt about screwing him over as he had screwed me over. The difference was that while he had screwed my wife, I was going to screw his life. No lube. Sandpaper condom. Once he was dressed, he ran from my bedroom and I heard the front door slam as he broke all land speed records getting away from me and my home. I looked at Samantha, and I could tell that she saw the malice in my eyes. Nick, we can get through this. She wheedled, crying crocodile tears. Please. Baby? Where was the baby when I got home? Samantha? Where was the love then? I sneered. Get dressed, get packed, and get out. I said. You have an hour. Since Dr. Dickhead doesn't want anything more to do with you, 
I suggest your folks. Samantha just looked at me in utter shock. She then started dressing and packing listlessly. I let her use all four of our suitcases, knowing that I was just going to buy new ones. I stepped into my home office and called the locksmith in the furniture store. I got the locksmith just as he was closing, but promised him a huge bonus to do a rush job on my locks. I then told the furniture store that I wanted a king size to replace our old queen size bed, sheets, comforter, and the whole nine. It was expensive, but worth it. He asked why I wanted the old bed thrown in my backyard, but I just told him that I wasn't paying him to ask questions. He picked up the tone in my voice and wisely shut his trap. Samantha was packed in 55 minutes, and in a magnanimous gesture, I helped her take her suitcases out to her car. In other words, I threw them on the driveway by her car's trunk. I then walked back into the house and slammed the door behind me. I called Wes and had him file for a restraining order with the Anight Court judge. I named both Samantha and Dr. Dennis Linder in my complaint. I then had him draw up divorce papers, alienation of affection papers, and malpractice papers. An hour later, both the locksmith and the furniture guys were done, and I paid both with my credit card. I called the credit card company and canceled Samantha's cards. I then called the manager of my bank at home and had him cancel Samantha's debit card. I gave no explanations, but as the primary on our accounts, I felt it necessary. I no longer trusted her. For those who think I was going too far, go to hell. I poured myself a couple shots of Chivas. Now, I'm usually a beer man, and I love beer beyond all other forms of drink. However, I needed something a bit stronger. So I poured my shots and sipped them as I thought about the train wreck that my marriage had turned into in such a short amount of time. At around 7 that night, I knew that I was about to lose it. I called Danny. Hola, chief. Danny said. Hey yourself, Danny. I hate to call you after hours, but I'm going to need your help tonight. I said. I was proud that the two shots of Chivas hadn't impaired my judgment or slurred my words. What's wrong, boss man? She asked. I never could put anything over on her. Well, it's complicated, and I don't want to tell you over the phone. Just come to my house. I said, feeling the walls start to crumble in my mind. Okay, chief. I'll be right there. She ended the call before I could respond. God bless that girl. Ten minutes later, she was knocking on my door. I got up from where I'd been staring at the blank TV screen and went to answer it. As soon as I had the door open, Danny was throwing herself into my arms, hugging me tightly. She kicked the door shut behind her then disengaged from our embrace long enough to throw the deadbolt. When she turned back, she grabbed my hand and pulled me back towards the couch. She sat me down and sat next to me. Okay, where's Sammy? She asked, already having some inkling of what was going on. After all, Sammy's car wasn't in the driveway, and I wasn't as distraught as I would have been if she'd died. I looked into the deep brown pools of Danny's eyes. She's gone. Probably to her parents' place. She was cheating on me, Danny. I could no longer hold my tears in check as she put her arms around me and held me as I ruined her blouse with my tears. I clung to her desperately, just needing the human contact. When I'd finally let it all out, Danny pushed me back gently and looked into my eyes. Nick, listen to me. Are you absolutely sure that Sammy was cheating on you? Not trusting my voice, I instead pulled out my pocket recorder and hit play as I set it on the coffee table. I then opened my cell and brought up the video and hit play before handing it to her. Danny watched and listened with growing horror in her eyes as I went and got two beers from the fridge. By the time I got back, dark fire was blazing in her eyes, and she had stopped both the recording and the video. I opened both arrogant jerk alish and handed her one. Danny finally exploded after taking a swig of the bitter ale. That witch. Wow, Danny wasn't holding back. I cracked a wry smile at her words. Danny is loyal to a fault, and she's loyal to me. She took another long swig then closed her eyes and breathed deeply several times. Nick, what are you planning? She asked as she laid her hand on mine. Because whatever it is, I want in. Nuclear strike on the doctor. I have reason to believe that maybe, Samantha was brainwashed. If so, I want to get her the help she needs. I said, my voice hoarse from the crying. If there was even the slightest possibility that the a-hole had somehow brainwashed or coerced her, I wanted to find out how. But as for Dr. Dingleberry himself, I want him and all those around him to burn, except for his wife, who you met earlier at the office. Turns out she was right about him cheating, and it was with my own wife. This is some shit, Nick. Danny shook her head in sympathy. But okay. What's our first move? Recon, of course. I managed a tight smile as I compartmentalized my feelings for the moment. 
Now that I was on the job, it was easy to slip back into the professional persona. In a few hours, I'm going to pay his office a little visit. If you have a problem with breaking and entering, you don't have to come. I told you I'm in, chief. I'm in it to win it, and you know I don't back down. She smiled at me, then leaned forward and hugged me tight. I know Sammy, Nick. I've known her almost as long as I've known you. I think she's been coerced at the very least by that cabron. I think so too, but even then, I'm not so sure I want her back. She shit all over us. She's known this tool for two months, and in that time, he managed to convince her that our marriage was just another toilet bowl in which to take a shit. I said, still hugging her tight. God, she felt good. I pushed her back gently as my body started stirring and looked into her eyes. There was something there that I hadn't seen in Samantha's eyes in a long time. Lust. Pure unbridled lust, and I was sorely tempted to kiss her right then and there. There were only two things stopping me. One, I was hoping that Samantha was a victim of brainwashing or coercion here, and that we could somehow work through all this. Two, even if she was more willing than she appeared, I wasn't going to stoop to her level and cheat with anyone, even Danny. Danny, I know what you're thinking, and you have no idea how tempting it is right now. But we have a job to do. I forced out the words through sheer iron willpower. I steeled my resolve and pressed onward. We'll swing by the office and pick up the van. Good call, boss, she said, curbing her own feelings. It didn't take a rocket scientist to see that she'd always had a bit of a crush on me. We'd flirt back and forth, but I thought she was okay with just flirting. But now that Sammy was out of the picture, for the moment at least, it was obvious she wanted more. Part of me was dying to give her what she wanted, and that part of me wanted it just as bad as she did. But, and here's the kicker, I was not going to do what my wife had done. No. My vengeance was going to be far more terrible if things went as I feared. Also, I didn't want to hurt Danny, and I knew that if Sammy had been coerced or brainwashed by Dr. Dickwad, Danny would be hurt badly if or when I decided to work things out with Sammy. We left in her car, and we picked up the van at the office. I grabbed the Comcast sign magnets out of the back and slapped them on the sides of the van. Urban camouflage? Gotta love it. We drove to the offices of Dr. Dennis Linder at around 11 that night and I went into the office building by Lopic. I was wearing supple calfskin gloves that would keep my fingerprints off of anything, yet allowed for enough freedom of movement that my dexterity wasn't impeded. Picking the locks was child's play, and once inside, I made sure that my earbud was working properly so I could communicate with Danny. Reading you loud and clear, Jeef, she said. I had a small USB thumb drive on me that had 50 gigabytes of storage space on it. I was going to search his computer as well as his filing cabinets. I wanted to get a really good look at this guy's business. If he was doing this to my wife, I wondered how many other wives he'd done it to so far. The security system was child's play. As I called the security company, identified myself as Dr. Linder, and told them that I had forgotten my passcode. It's amazing what the power of a good bluff can get you. I sounded authoritative, slightly pompous, and they bought it without even asking for a confirmation password. Amateurs. Danny giggled over my earpiece. I know, right? I chuckled quietly as I picked the lock to the doctor's office itself. I made a beeline for his computer, bringing it out of sleep mode. There were no family pictures on his desk. Wow, he didn't love his wife very much. I shook my head that this a-hole, who had a hell of a hot woman at home, was stepping out with at least one of his patients. Password protected. Shit. 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 Okay, don't panic. I reviewed what I knew about Dr. Linder. He was intelligent, if not very street smart. He was cunning when it came to seducing women. On the ride over, Danny had given me the other dirt she dug up on Dr. Dishabag after I'd left. He was a serial womanizer, when we read between the lines of other patients of his who had filed malpractice or even pressed sexual harassment charges on him. Then those charges were dropped without real cause. Just some cliched, misunderstanding bullshit when asked by the cops. I already hated the guy. Now I was ready to kill him slowly and with great enjoyment as he suffered the ultimate in physical and emotional pain. So, with his womanizing tendencies in mind, I typed in Romeo as a possible password. Access denied. Casanova. Access denied. Lothario. Access granted. What a predictable a-hole. Finding the files that I needed wasn't difficult, either. Wow, this son of a witch was arrogant. I popped in the thumb drive and downloaded his whole special patients section which damn near filled up the entire 50 gigs of space. I noted some of the names, including Samantha Carter. That creep. He had video files of Sammy on here. Fine. Whatever. 
I ejected the thumb drive and sent his computer back into sleep mode. Then I went rifling through his filing cabinets. I found Sammy's file, but nothing on it seemed to indicate what they had done. So he wasn't completely stupid as to list his sexual conquests in his paper files. Anything yet, Jeef? Danny asked over the earpiece. Lots, darlin, I replied. Nothing paper, but I have about 45 gigs of videos that he's recorded with quite a few of his patients. Damn it. Okay. We're going to need to look those over when we get home, she said. I had a funny feeling about the way she said, we, and home, when talking about our plans for the immediate future. When I left the office, I made sure that the doors were all locked and that there was no trace that I had ever been there. No security cameras. Just the phone call that I'd made from a burner phone with an untraceable number. Voice ID could cause a problem if someone cares enough, but I wasn't going to worry about it right then. It was well after 1 a.m. when we got back to my place. We got inside after I put the garage door down, and before I could say anything, Danny blindsided me. I'm staying the night with you, Nick. She said it firmly, no room for argument. Okay. I shrugged. You can have the guest room. No, Nick. I'm staying in your room in your new bed, and I'm not taking no for an answer. You shouldn't be alone tonight, even if we don't have sex. And there it was out in the open. The invisible elephant had been revealed. Danny, I trust you. Shit, you're about the only woman on earth that I trust right now. I'm asking you to please don't make me break my marriage vows tonight. Okay. I asked. I promise. She said with a smile, then kissed my cheek. We'll go over the footage in the morning. I brought my laptop, so we can split the videos and get them done twice as fast. Sounds like a plan, sweetie. I said as I headed in to get a shower. I felt filthy and not just because I hadn't had a shower since before I went to work the previous morning. As I stood under the water, my mental compartment opened and all the feelings of betrayal came rushing back. I was sobbing against the wall of the shower when I heard the shower door slide open. The next thing I knew, I was being held by a wet and naked female. Danny held me close, stroking my back as she washed me. I would have probably taken her without a second thought. Something that I, at least, would regret in the morning. She dried us both off then guided me into my bedroom. She didn't even bother with pajamas or a nightshirt. She put me in bed, covered me with the sheet, and then went around and climbed in the other side. I numbly fell asleep shortly after my eyes closed. I was completely exhausted, both physically and emotionally. I awoke the next morning with a smile on my face. Sammy had spooned me during the night, her body pressing into my back. Shit. I shouted, then jumped off the bed like it was on fire. It was real. It wasn't just a dream. Sammy really had cheated on me and left me. Danny got up and hugged me close. God, she was putting on the full court press with me. I decided to nip it in the bud. Danny, listen to me, okay? I croaked. At her reluctant nod, I continued. Danny, I'm sorry for that just now. I thought yesterday was just a really bad nightmare. I'd be lying if I said I didn't think of you in that way sometimes. But I love my wife, or who she used to be before that scumbag got his hands on her. But I promise you one thing right now. If Samantha went along with this all willingly, I'm going to divorce her. When that's done, if you still want me, I'm more than willing to try with you. Okay. And that's one reason I fell in love with you. She sighed in resignation. You're the most honorable man I've ever met. Her voice was equal parts admiration and exasperation. Thanks, sweetie. I kissed her cheek as I released her nubile body. I got a good look at her without the tears in my eyes. And she literally took my breath away. She's tan all over, with no tan lines. Dear Lord, I was being tempted like I'd never been tempted before. Like what you see, Poppy? She gave me a seductive grin. Uh-huh. I managed. Hey, all the blood was in my small head at that point. My brain was oxygen-deprived. I had swollen to mammoth proportions compared to normal. Danny looked down and smiled, but didn't reach for me. When this is over, and if you aren't with Sammy again, I'm going to screw your brains out for the rest of our lives, Poppy. She whispered, which made my tool jump even more. Danny, if I'm not with Sammy when the dust settles, I'll let you. I whispered back. Then I got dressed and Danny left the room, but I heard the sizzle of the frying pan out in the kitchen. I smiled at that, then got dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, put on my belt with Colt and holster, and went out to join her. I didn't usually wear my pistol at home, but I wasn't going to take any chances with a possibly sociopathic psychologist out there. I noticed that Danny was also wearing her piece. A Lady Smith and Wesson in 9mm. She'd also gotten a concealed carry permit shortly after I hired her. Smells good. 
I said with the first big genuine smile I'd had since this whole mess started. Thanks, Nick. She shot me a cute grin, then went back to turning the omelet she was making. I smelled bacon in there, as well as cheese and salsa. She really knew her stuff. She was dressed in one of my old t-shirts and the jeans she'd worn last night. Her blouse was still on the floor in the bedroom. Danny, I know this is going to be tough on both of us. I said as I sat down on a bar stool at the kitchen counter. She looked at me and raised her eyebrow. Boss, I didn't sign on to be coddled. You made it clear from day one that I would most likely be needed on some cases, and with my background in criminal justice, you knew you could count on me. That hasn't and won't ever change. I couldn't help falling in love with you, but that doesn't mean I'm going to shy away from this one. This case is personal to me too, since Sammy is my friend. That Pendejo doctor is going to get a rude awakening by the time we're done with him. Every word she said was true. She'd been a detective for two years in the LAPD but had been drummed out for beating a sexual assault suspect half to death. She'd been lucky to avoid serious charges, but as the son of a witch had been guilty, they didn't want the bad publicity of filing charges on her. She'd been given a nice little severance package to keep her mouth shut about the circumstances of her termination, but she'd been upfront about it with me when I'd first interviewed her. It was one reason I'd given her the job. I wanted someone who wasn't afraid to get his or her hands dirty. Danny was definitely not afraid to get her hands dirty. Sometimes, I just forgot that about her. You're right. I nodded. Danny, I need to tell you something about me that not even Sammy knows. I took a deep breath. I knew I could trust Danny. She trusted me, and I had verified the veracity of who she was and why she'd been fired. What do you mean? She asked, a confused look on her face. Danny, I never worked for an insurance company. I worked for the company as a covert operative. There. My name is Nick Carter, and I used to be a spy and that sounds like a really bad impression of the opening of Burn Notice. Danny just looked at me, then plated our omelets and brought them to the counter, along with mugs of coffee. God bless Danny. I sort of figured that. It was either that, or you had a criminal record someplace. She shrugged. You're always looking around you like someone might be watching you. You don't show it much, but I've spotted it over the years we've been together. You know a lot about bugs and how to tap a phone in record time. And then there's your lockpicking ability which rates right up there with the best cab burglars in the business. I laughed outright. She really was a shit-hot detective. You're good. I said, raising my mug of coffee to her before taking a sip. Em, just right. Oh, and you make the best damn coffee on earth. Just so you know. I said. It was her turn to laugh. Thanks, boss. She said. I'm not just a pretty face and a hot body, you know. She winked. I know. If you were just those things, I wouldn't have hired you. I shrugged. She leaned over and gave me a kiss in the cheek. Thank you, Nick. No matter how this goes, thank you for everything. She smiled. Hey, you act like you're going to be leaving. Not gonna happen. I smirked at her. You'll be working with me until we're both old and gray. She just regarded me for a moment. You know, you're right. She grinned. I couldn't leave you if I got a job paying a million bucks a day. Good. I said because I can't afford that, and you're the best damn assistant I could ever hope for. I'm glad you finally acknowledged that, boss. Now, eat your food before I smack you. She stuck her tongue out at me, so I stuck mine out back. Then I really dug in, and her omelet was amazingly good. God, that girl can cook. There are two schools of thought on the way to a man's heart, and all that stuff they teach girls. One is through his stomach, and the other is through his willy. For me, it's both. Granted, Sammy is a tornado in bed, was my tornado in bed, and she could cook reasonably well. But, and you knew there was a but coming, Danny's skill in the kitchen easily put Sammy to shame. If she had sex half as good as she cooks, I was seriously considering trading up, even if Sammy had been brainwashed by Dr. Dick Fungus. That might sound cold, but she had succumbed fairly easily without discussing anything with me at all. I couldn't believe that she would go behind my back to see a quack shrink like Linder and not discuss anything with me. That itself was unlike her. She used to tell me everything, early on in our relationship. It had only been in the past couple months since starting her therapy that she had shut me out pretty much completely. Once breakfast was done, I helped Danny with the dishes. Once done, she turned and before I could react, slipped her arms around my neck and pulled my face to hers. She kissed me passionately, and for a few seconds, I returned her kiss just as hotly. Our tongues dueled for dominance, and then I backed off blushing like a schoolboy. I'm sorry, Nick, she said quietly. No, Danny, 
I don't think either one of us is sorry for that. I chuckled. Damn, I wish I'd met you before my wife. So do I. She said sadly. Shit. Someone was going to end up getting hurt, no matter how this turned out. I really didn't want it to be either of them if Sammy had been coerced or brainwashed. We had to watch those videos. Come on, let's go watch those vids and see if they can shine some light on Sammy's mental state. I said. We went into the den, where I kept my home office, and I downloaded half of the videos to her laptop. I started where I needed to start. With Sammy. The first interview was pretty basic. Just a getting to know you session. Dr. Dick Sucker was jotting stuff down in his notepad while asking Sammy questions about her life. He asked about her husband, me, and about any other family. She told him about her parents and about how much she loved us all. I studied his face, and a sly little smile played across his lips at that. He then asked a few more innocuous questions, and then told her not to speak of this to anyone, as it could adversely affect their future therapy sessions. That son of a witch. He had set out to seduce her from the start, and since she had followed his instructions on keeping me in the dark, and I had no clue what was going on, I couldn't have done a damn thing to stop it. He had abused her trust in him as a medical professional. Malpractice suit. Check. The second vid was more questions. More personal questions this time. He asked her about our sex life. She answered truthfully, and I couldn't help feeling a swell of pride when she admitted that I gave her multiple climax each time we had sex. He just jotted stuff in his infernal notepad about each answer she gave. He asked some more personal questions that she seemed reluctant to answer, but he reassured her that nobody else would ever know about what she said. She answered truthfully again. It ended with him reiterating the need to keep these session confidential. She agreed. I checked the dates on the videos. There were 16 videos of Sammy's sessions, and that corresponded to his Monday and Wednesday appointments. I groaned as I put my face in my hands. The third vid was difficult to watch. But once again, he didn't brainwash her or coerce her in any way other than professional ethics, as he called it. She told him about her fantasies, and a lot of them I already knew about and had helped her fulfill. Some, however, were things she'd never told me about, before. She wanted to tie me up? She wanted to dominate me in the bedroom? Jesus. She'd never said anything to me about those. Once again, after she was done telling him what he wanted to know, he stressed the need for secrecy and sent her on her way. The fourth vid was when he started his insidious seduction in full. He asked her to describe her domination fantasies in detail, so she launched into graphic descriptions of what she wanted to do to me, and I listened raptly to each thing she said. She got through two of them before time was up. Once again, the secrecy agreement, and she was on her way. The fifth and sixth videos were very similar to the fourth. The seventh and eighth videos were more fantasies of hers where she would screw me. I was beginning to see why she wouldn't have told me about these fantasies. I just shook my head as she told him personal things about herself that she had never shared with me, her own husband. He then suggested having two men at once to her, and showed her a video clip of a woman in a sandwich, with one guy from front and the other in back. When she saw that, the wheels in her brain started turning, and she said she would think about that one. That was his kicker, and I saw his sly grin of triumph at the end of the video. He once again urged her to keep their sessions confidential, and then let her go. The rest of the videos were mostly him talking to her about her fantasies thus far. He enumerated each fantasy and pointed to how she was actually a dominant personality that had been subservient all her life, and had grown to accept it. First, she was subservient to her family. Then she was subservient to me. He built up her self-worth to the point of egotism by the end of the 14th video and had convinced her to have two men, including me, as part of her therapy. I noticed that starting in that one, he didn't urge her to keep quiet, knowing she wouldn't tell anyone, including me. It was the 15th video where he first screwed her, just a little under a week and a half ago. He told her that he would be the second man if she wanted him to be. She said she didn't know. She looked like she struggled with the decision for a solid 15 minutes as he gently urged her towards where he wanted her mind to be. She finally gave in, and he laid down on his desk and told her to dominate him. She did. The 16th vid was the last. She came in, and before he could say anything, she kissed him passionately and then screwed him hard. She said that she didn't just want a two-on-one, she wanted to cuck me with him. That was the clincher right there. It showed me that she was beyond saving. She made a conscious decision to cuck me instead of the original plan of having sex with her along with him. This time, she told him to keep it quiet, and she would call him with the right day and time. I stopped the video, 
and looked up to see Danny looking at me with tears in her eyes and a disgusted look on her face that probably mirrored my own disgust. The guy was a serial seducer. A real Lothario. That made sense with his password on the computer, at least. I'm hitting this son of a witch with a legal warhead so big. He's going to wish he'd never been born. I vowed in a calm voice before God and Danny. I'm with you on that one, boss. She said as she sat on the edge of my desk. It seems that the longer video sets are more challenging. If it makes you feel any better, all the others are fewer than Sammy's. She held out the longest, apparently. She shrugged and gave me a hopeful smile. I sort of figure that, since all the ones left on here are shorter than hers. But you just confirmed it. This guy makes Machiavelli look like a good guy. I shook my head. But as far as coercion or brainwashing, he's not guilty on those counts. He just convinces them to do it, and there won't be any harm in it. Yeah, I noticed that too. From what I can tell, he's never involved the husband before in their little games. But then, the husband finds out somehow and divorces his wife. All the ones I've checked so far have ended up in divorce. She listed the names of the women and their ex-husbands. Okay. Contact a couple of the exes and find out how they found out about Dr. Dickless seducing their wives. I need to talk to Janine. I shoot her out of the room, then pulled out my cell and called Janine's phone. Hello? Janine, it's Nick. I said in a tight voice. Oh, Nick. Thank you for calling. Are you going to start your investigation today? She asked. I've completed it, actually. You are more correct than you know. Is there any way you can come to my house either tonight or tomorrow? There are some things we need to discuss of a personal as well as professional nature. Don't get me wrong. I'm not hitting on you, but this case has hit a bit close to home for me. I explained. Care to elaborate on that, Nick? She inquired. Not over the phone, ma'am. Either tonight or tomorrow morning would be best. My assistant Danny will be here with us, since she has some info to share with you as well. I told her. What's your address? I gave her my address, and she said she would be here in 10 minutes. 11 minutes later, I heard a car in the driveway. I checked, and she'd driven a nice Jaguar XJ6. I opened the door for her, and Danny brought her coffee while I went and got mine and Danny's laptops. I set both of them up on the coffee table and Danny and I sat on either side of Janine as I started to explain things. Janine, Dennis is a serial cheater who uses his position of professional authority and trust to seduce women and cut their husbands behind their backs. I said, from what we've seen so far, he only goes after married women. There are no single women in these videos. Danny added, now, each video series chronicles a seduction. He gains their trust then talks about fantasies or problems in their marriages. He uses this information to seduce them and make them do exactly what he wants them to do. He doesn't coerce or brainwash his victims, but he's a serial offender, as you can see. I said, showing her all the series of videos. She gasped at how many there were. How the hell could he have kept this a secret? She screamed, her face turning beet red with rage. Janine, stay calm please. There's more. I said, swallowing the lump in my throat more. She looked at me like I had just fallen off another planet. Yes, ma'am. As I said on the phone, this one hit really close to home for me. You see, my wife was his latest conquest. I showed her the name Samantha Carter on the video series I highlighted. Oh my god. I'm so sorry, Nick. Janine hugged me tight. He's going to pay for this. Be sure of that. He's going to pay through the goddamn bleeding ass I'm going to give him for this shit. Janine, how much is your husband worth, monetarily? I will be filing alienation of affection and malpractice against him. I said, don't worry. I'll introduce you to the best damn divorce attorney in California. Wes will take good care of you and get you as much as possible. Janine laughed. Oh, honey. Dennis is worth over $250 million, including his properties around the world. He has a lucrative practice, his books are bestsellers, and he's been on Dr. Phil as a guest several times. The majority of his money was made from his books, though. Okay, what I propose is we hit him with a blitzkrieg. We hit him hard and fast, but it's going to take probably a few days to set up. Do you trust us? I asked her, indicating me and Danny. Yes, she said. You've lost a lot too, Nick. I'm sorry for that. I should have seen what a snake he was before this. I understand. Come by my office in the morning and I'll introduce you to Wes. He's my attorney and will be handling my divorce from Samantha as well as my suits against your husband. But by Friday, we hope to have some other ex-husbands on board to file suits against him for malpractice and alienation of affection as well. I laid out my plan to her, and she was nodding and smiling by the time I was done. 
I can go along with that. The problem is going to be acting normal around him for two more days. I can claim female problems or just go out of town to visit my mother. She's old, so he would probably buy that. Janine nodded. True, he's trained to spot differences in mood or behavior. My advice is to get a hold of your mother, tell her what's going on, and have her cover for you. Meanwhile, I have a guest room here with a queen-sized bed in it, and room for two more cars in my garage. I smiled. So far, only my car and Danny's car were in there. I handed her a remote for the garage door, and she accepted gratefully. She went home to pack. Danny also went home to pack. She packed a whole week's worth of clothes and came back half an hour later. I chuckled as she hauled her stuff into my room and put it in Sammy's old dresser. The girl is determined. I'll give her that. The next morning, Janine got back just as I got out of bed after another great night's sleep with Danny by my side. She was now wearing an oversized t-shirt of mine and panties to sleep in, for which I was grateful. I was wearing boxers and pajama pants and a t-shirt as well. Danny was in the shower when I heard the garage door going up. Janine looked great and gave me a sympathetic hug and kiss on the cheek when I went to meet her as soon as she came inside. She had a small suitcase with her with a couple changes of clothes inside. She also brought me bank statements for Denny Boy's accounts, and I gawked at how much he had in liquid assets. When Danny had cooked breakfast for us all, and we'd eaten another great meal, Janine told us that she was ready to move forward. I told her that we would be able to move once every ex-husband and wife were notified of the most recent developments. We had 11 ex-husbands to call, and then informed them to call their ex-wives and inform them of what was going down. We were going to file separate lawsuits against Dr. Dumptruck for malpractice and alienation of affection, and they were more than welcome to join us. Not surprisingly, most of the husbands were more than ready to get some payback on a hole, and even a good majority of the ex-wives were chomping at the bit. I wasn't about to get Sammy in on it, though. Not after seeing the last video. I showed up at Wes's office along with nine out of the eleven ex-husbands we'd been able to contact, and all nine ex-wives. Since I was ex-husband number twelve, I would be in on it. Wes, to save time, drew up identical A of A and malpractice papers and just put different names in there, depending on who was in line. He was like a kid in a candy store, with well over 175 mil in liquid assets from Dr. Dumb and almost 100 mil in properties around the world that would most probably have to be liquidated to pay for the malpractice, divorce, and alienation of affection suits. Sure, a class action would have been simpler all around, but we were going for shock value on this one. I wanted Dr. Dennis, the menace, Linder to know his world was about to come a-tumbling down around him like the walls of Jericho. Janine was waiting with Danny and me at the end of the line while Wes happily helped his new throng of customers to make an a-hole's life miserable and get rich while doing it. Yes, he's a good buddy of mine, but he's still an attorney. When he was finally done printing out malpractice and A of a paperwork for his new clients, and sent them on their merry way with the promise that he would have them delivered to Dr. Dingus at work, bright and early Monday morning with plenty of witnesses. It was Janine's in my turn. I filed for divorce from Samantha, and Janine filed for divorce from her soon-to-be-very-poor soon-to-be ex-hubby. Wes was taken with Janine immediately, and it seemed the attraction was mutual. I set it up with Wes for each client's stuff to be delivered by a different process server all at the same time. Wes, Janine, and Danny all joined me in grinning like skeletons at that one. He was about to be overrun, come Monday morning, and Danny and I, along with Janine, were going to have a front row seat. As a bonus, Wes threw in a restraining order against Dr. Dumb for free for each of us, his clients. He knew how rich he was going to be once all the fallout had settled around this mass nuclear strike. Then it was time for Phase 2. Phase 2 involved media and law enforcement saturation. I used Sammy's videos, blotting out her face and changing her voice to a computer blurb, blotting out all mention of her or my names, all using a new media editor program I'd bought. I spliced together segments from different videos, showing how Dr. Dennis Linder made a habit of seducing women away from happy marriages or marriages that had the possibility to be happy again after his therapy. But he had seen the need to ruin said marriages for his own twisted ego. I used segments from the videos of the other women too, showing how they had all been manipulated into turning against their husbands at Linder's urging. I knew the news media would eat this one up. The FBI would get involved for criminal malpractice, since he was ripping men off and having sex with their wives. The California Board of Psychology was also going to take an interest in this one. I had a dummy account email account set up for this, and used proxy servers so I couldn't be traced. Phase 2 started Monday morning, 
just after the process servers had done their job. As the last process server left, I handed Janine the popcorn bucket, and she was munching some popcorn as Denny Boy came running out the front of his office, looking around wildly. He saw me, standing next to his soon-to-be ex along with Danny. I held up my cell phone, hit the send button on the mass email delivery, and initiated phase two. We got in my car and drove away as Dr. Dick screamed at us incoherently that he was going to kill us all. The last I saw of him that day, he was kneeling in the parking lot, a whole shitload of paperwork in his hands, and he was crying his eyes out. My vengeance wasn't over by half. Phase three involved a sit-down with Samantha, which she agreed to do. She had been staying with her folks, and was about to find out that she wouldn't be able to stay there anymore, unless she was really lucky. We met in a very public place. Starbucks. Gotta love it. I'm here. Does this mean you want to talk? She asked hopefully as she sat across from me. As a matter of fact, I do need to tell you something. I said with a smile. Samantha, I would have been able to forgive you just about anything, if you had been coerced or brainwashed by that a-hole. I'm not kidding. But after watching 16 hours of you going along with everything he said, even with your protestations, you, in the end, suggested cucking me to live out your domination fantasy. That, I cannot forgive or forget. I shook my head slowly. Sammy, I would have done damn near anything for you. I loved you more than you can possibly know. Loved, as in past tense. I would have given my life for you, until I saw that betrayal. That ultimate betrayal of everything we meant to each other. I'm sorry, Samantha. But you've been served. I slid the divorce papers across to her. I think you'll find it fair, considering. She looked at the paperwork in shock. You're kidding. I wasn't in my right mind, baby. Please, you have to believe me. She panicked, and then I let the other boot drop. If I were you, I would think of something to tell your parents, Samantha. Something tells me that they just got an anonymous email showing them what kind of a daughter they raised. I stood and walked out, leaving her in stunned silence. Wes asked Janine out, and she had accepted. I vouched for his integrity, such as it is. When she asked about that, I said, he's a divorce lawyer. I shrugged. Then I'll just have to keep my eye on him. She grinned. But seriously, he's a good guy. I wouldn't work with him if he wasn't. I said, easing up on my friend. The next day, Wes called me and told me that Sammy and her lawyer were there and wanted to talk. I agreed, and drove over with Danny with me for moral support. Okay, I'm here. I said as I sat down opposite Sammy and her lawyer, who looked a bit like Gloria Allred, and Danny sat with me and Wes. Mr. Carter, I'm Gene Albrick. I'm going to be representing your wife in this. From what she's told me, you have destroyed her utterly, which is why I'm taking her case pro bono. I will start by saying that these terms are unacceptable. She finished her initial tirade. Ms. Albrook, let me point out that I have enough evidence to sway any judge and jury in the world to my point of view. It shows my soon-to-be ex they're plotting with her lover to cuck me. It was her suggestion, even. For the record, I am not into that lifestyle, nor will I ever be. Under those circumstances, I believe my proposal is more than adequate. I finished, sitting back. And where is this evidence? Allred Jr. asked. Wes, God bless him, started the DVD he burned of the last two sessions between Samantha and the good doctor. He also had the recording from my pocket recorder and the video from my iPhone on the DVD as well. The video showed them planning it all, where she would play the confused and helpless victim who just wanted to explore her sexuality and Dr. Linder coaxing her on. It then cut to my own recorder as I came in and found them together. Then the iPhone video of them having sex on our marital bed. Then me pulling him off of her and throwing him to the floor. I have the rest if you want it. Wes said with a shit-eating grin. Just say the word, and I'll make copies of everything for you. Gloria Jr. looked like she would rather be anywhere else but there at that moment. She looked at the proposal that I did Wes draw up. It was actually pretty fair, considering the shit she'd put me through. She would get 75k and her car paid off. She would get her belongings, to be picked up at my discretion, and she would be given an apartment paid for by me, for an entire year. No children, so no child support. No alimony, though. That, I had refused. No way was I going to pay her until she got married again. But the apartment was at least a nice one. After consulting with Samantha, Gloria's younger clone looked at me. We'll take it, Mr. Carter. Good call. I smiled. We all signed on the dotted lines, Jean notarized it, and it would be brought before a judge in 30 days. Those 30 days dragged by so slow. I wanted to rip my hair out. Every day, Danny and I would make out like teenagers, but I still couldn't go all the way with her. I wanted to like you would not believe, 
but I was being stubborn, or some would say stupid. By the end, I was leaning more towards stupid myself. Finally, our court date arrived. We'd had no cases since the Linder case, so it had been maddening waiting for the hours to tick away until we could officially be together. When the judge banged his gavel, I took Danny into my arms and kissed her until our toes curled. Sammy came up to us as we broke apart. I'm sorry, Nick. For whatever that's worth, I screwed up the best thing I ever had. She had tears in her eyes as she looked at Danny. Danny, please take care of him, and don't be stupid like I was. Sammy, I've been in love with Nick since I first laid eyes on him. I kept my distance, since he loved you with everything he had. I kept my distance because you were my friend too. You're both my friends, but when you did what you did to him, I couldn't stand by any longer. I'm not sorry, either. I love this man, and I promise you I will take care of him for the rest of our lives. Danny surprised me with that one too, but she really surprised Sammy and hugged her friend tightly. Danny had moved in with me during that 30-day wait. It had been something to do while we were waiting for my stupidity to either falter or the divorce to go through. So when we got home that day from court, I pulled off my old wedding ring and threw it on the coffee table before picking Danny up and carrying her to our bedroom. Oh, Poppy. She giggled as I threw her on the bed and stripped down in record time. She was stripping too, which didn't take long. I had sex with her like she was built for it. It was two and a half years before all the fallout had settled from my nuclear strike on Dr. Dennis Linder, and a lot of people felt the fallout in one way or another. Several couples that had been split by the a-hole's actions ended up reconciling and remarrying after receiving their settlements from their alienation of affection and malpractice suits. Okay, good for them. I heard from Samantha shortly after all the malpractice suits and alienation of affection suits went a trial against Dr. Diptert. Anyway, Samantha now lives in Vegas and became a dominatrix. Seems right up her alley with the shit that Linder had opened up in her psyche. Her parents still aren't speaking to her, thanks to my surgical strike against her by sending them the video of her and her lover plotting against me. Oh, well, she brought it on herself. After Janine divorced him, of which she got well over half, all the criminal charges came down on old Denny boy like a ton of bricks. He pled out to what he could, but lost his license and after all the suits were over, had to file bankruptcy. That didn't stop all those he'd wronged from getting their due rewards, however. It just delayed it a little. Someone who shall remain nameless paid the good doctor a visit one night before his criminal trial started. Whoever that person was, beat Dr. Dushabag so badly, he had to be hospitalized for a few weeks. He had both knees broken, both arms broken, and both of his balls had been ruptured. As to how I know all this. Well, ask me no questions, and I'll tell you no lies. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go clean my old aluminum baseball bat. Wes and Janine dated for six months and hit it off so well, they got married with me as best man and Danny as maid of honor. Wes made enough from all the lawsuits to retire, and they plan on spending their golden years together. The trial was pretty much open and shut, since Dr. Dushabag attorney couldn't get the video evidence suppressed of how Escolio had seduced all those women. He was convicted on all counts. And when Denny Boy got to prison, he lasted all of two days before the guards found him swinging in his cell. It seems that he had fallen so hard, so fast, he actually hanged himself rather than face the train wreck his life had become. Good. One less burden on society. The a-hole, who had ruined so many lives, was now literally at the end of his rope. Fitting, if you ask me. With his demise, and since he never changed his will, Janine was only too happy to use her large inherited amount of funds to settle with those whose lives her now deceased ex-hubby had ruined. As for Danny and I, we made out like fat cats from my lawsuits. Fifteen million, all told. Fifteen million dollars. I had said as I placed my pinky to the side of my mouth. We're retired now too, and raising our two children. Our son, Nicholas, since Danny insisted on giving him a full name, which of course I agreed with immediately, is already a handful, and about to start preschool next year. Isabel, our daughter, is the sweetest baby I've ever seen. We're happy now. That case, my last case, was a mixed bag for me, but turned out all right in the end. Dear listeners, Please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.